All right, z-scores. This is the beginning of statistics. So the stats that I'm about to present, they follow a very clear logical sequence. And basically what you're doing, well, first two, kind of. Basically what you're going to see happening is you're pulling pieces of information away. Right? So z-score is sort of like best of all possible worlds. Um, a z-score happens when it would happen, for example, with GRE scores would be a good example of a z-score or IQ scores. Or if you ever have your tests actually curve, not where the teacher says, oh, I'm going to give everyone an extra 10 points, but they actually curve them, right? They're going to use z-scores. So if you had all the scores in a class, you could say here was the mean, it was 60%, the standard deviation was 10 points or whatever. Um, and what a z-score does is it just standardizes a raw score. And what I mean when I say that is it tells you how many standard deviations a score is off from the mean. So a z-score can be directly interpreted as the number of standard deviations a score is off from the mean, right? And you can see that here mathematically. So if you look at this formula, your z-score is just your raw score, x, minus the mean divided by standard deviation, right? So if the mean's 100, you get a 120 on your IQ test, standard deviation is 10, your two standard deviations off the mean, your z-score would be positive too. Right? If you got an 80, it would be minus 2. I think, again, this is probably, this is like sort of base level. Importantly, a z-score is for one score. Notice that's x and not x bar. Next step up is a z-test. Now, a z-test is used when you have a sample from a population. So you're no longer dealing with a single score. Now you're dealing with a set of scores. Right? But you know the population's mean and standard deviation. And this is really important because this is going to differentiate us from t-tests. So you know that the mean is 100. You know that the standard deviation is 10. But now you have 30 people whose mean IQ score is, say, 120. Right? Does that make sense? So with a z-test, you have to use the what's called the standard error of the mean. Are you guys familiar with standard error? Standard error of the mean is basically the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. I want to explain the basic logic of this. I didn't put a bunch of my slides about sampling distributions because I didn't think we were going to have time. Oh, we might, but this is perfect. OK. Imagine you have this normal distribution, right? You know all these great things about the normal distribution. You know that the mean is 100, right? You know that your standard deviation is 10. What's the probability, say, that you're going to pull a score of 120 out of that distribution? Just randomly. You, you, you mix them all in a hat. You reach your hand, and you pull out one score, and it's 120. Does anyone know? Probability of pulling a score of 120, mean is 100, standard deviation is 10? Less than 5. Yeah, it's about 5%. Right? That would be a z-score of 2. A z-score of 2 corresponds to about the 5% level. Right? So you've got about a 1 in 20 chance of pulling a single score out that's 120. Right? That sounded weird. Um, does that make sense? Now, what's the probability that I pull out 10 scores and the mean of those 10 scores is 120. A lot less. Way less, right? One way to think about it is, what's the probability you pull out one score that's 120? 5%. What's the probability then that you pull out another score that's 120? Also 5%. The Assuming that you put the other one down? Sure, sure. That's, and again, with very large populations, as a, a reasonable assumption. Um, Right. Technically, probabilistically, it's not that easy um, the way I'm painting it. But more or less, they, they multiply. So you have a 5% chance of a 5% chance that you would pull 2. Right? Does this make sense? Probability that you would pull 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. By the time you get to 10, the probability that you would pull 10 scores randomly out of this population is very, very small. Wait, is it 5% of 5% or is it 5% times 5%? They're the same. Are they? Yes. If you have a number and you multiply it times the, the subjective probability, you get the okay. um, Yeah. Does that make sense? So you got to correct for this, right? Because if I pull a score out that's 120, I'm like, oh, there's a 5% chance I did that. My z score is going to give me 5%, right? If I pull 10 out, I can't just use the same distribution. I can't use the same sort of logic to reason through it, right? Because it's way more unlikely. I can't say, oh, it's 5%. It's like 0. 0.00000 something percent. It's very, very small. Right? So instead, what I have to do is create what's called a sampling distribution. And a sampling distribution, it's sort of like a mental exercise. 
these things don't, I mean, I guess they could really exist, but they don't generally really exist. The math does it for us, but I just want to walk you through the logic one so you understand sort of what's going on here. So you know you have 10 scores, you know you have this population, and you know you just pulled a mean of 120, right? And you also know that you can't just compare it with the standard deviation you had before, right? So instead what you do is imagine that you now go back and you pull randomly out of this population, you pull 10 scores out and you calculate the mean, right? Let's say they have a mean of 101. That would be a likely thing to get. Now you plot that on a new distribution. Do it again. Pull out 10 scores again. Plot that on a new distribution. Do that again. Pull out 10 scores. Plot the mean on a new distribution. Do you guys see what I'm doing? Does this make sense when I explain it like this? So you're sampling, and now let's say you do that an infinite number of times. You take all possible samples, and you create this new distribution of sampling means, right? What's that sampling distribution going to look like compared to your original distribution? So let me put it this way. What if th th this is the best conceptual way I can think to explain this in the best way that makes sense to me? What if your, s your sample was everyone in the population, right? If you plotted that, what would it look like? Well, it would be the normal distribution. It would just be the mean, right? So, so we're plotting the means of the samples? Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry if that was unclear. So we're pulling a sample, we're calculating the mean of the sample, and then we're plotting that value. Right? And then we do it again and again and again. What's the sampling distribution of these means going to look like compared to our original distribution? Normal? But it's the same. It's similar They're not going to be the same, right? Because so in that one, you might have a few, quite a few scores out at 120. But in this new one, we're not going to get many out there, right? Because it would be really unlikely that you're going to get very many samples of 120 so that you can imagine the tails aren't going to be quite as wide, right? And we're going to have a whole lot more right around the mean, right? It's going to go, it's going to get skinnier. So essentially it sucks in. So if this is your distribution, if you take a sample size of two, say, and you plot their means, it's going to suck a little. Sample size of three, suck in more, 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 until the limit, the way that I always think about this, the way you constrain it is if your sample hypothetically was every single person in the population, and you kept doing it and plotting them, what would you get? You just get a straight line, right? It would just go straight up from the mean. Does that make sense? So that sort of pins the two extremes. One is the distribution we started with of all the raw scores. The other extreme is as your sample gets bigger, it comes closer and closer to approximating just a, a distribution of the mean. Does that make sense? So in this example where we pulled a group of 10 out and we got a mean of 120, if we want to know what the probability of that was, we can't compare it to the original distribution, right? We've got to compare it to this new distribution that we made. Does that make sense? I'm seeing confusion. Is that because that's the only one we have? It's because it's, if you compare the mean of 10 scores to a distribution based on single scores, you're comparing apples to oranges. So you have to compare the mean of 10 scores to a distribution of means of groups of 10. Does that make sense? That's a sampling distribution. It's a little bit of a complicated concept, which is why I didn't add a whole bunch in here about it. I just want to give you the gist. The main point is that it's way more unlikely that you're going to pull a group mean at an extreme value than you're going to pull a single score at an extreme value, right? So to correct for that, we use the standard error of the mean instead of the standard deviation. And what the standard error of the mean is, is it's the standard deviation of that sampling distribution that you just built. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. So notice this looks almost exactly the same as a z-score. Right? You'll notice there's two differences. One is that x bar there, that's the mean of our sample rather than an individual score, minus the mean of our population. And you'll notice down at the bottom, you see the standard deviation symbol, but it has the little subscript of x bar. That's because it's the standard error of the mean. This is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution as opposed to the standard deviation of just the population. Does that make sense? And again, sampling distributions, to a large extent, you can actually construct them. I mean, you could write a computer program that could do this a million times and give you an actual sampling distribution. There's actually cool software online that will do this for you if you want to know more about <coughs> it. Um, but we don't have to do that, because hypothetically, we can do it with this math equation right here.
All this does is correct for the fact that we have a sample size of n. Oh, it should be little n. Doesn't matter though. Um, all that this does is correct for the fact that we're not looking at one score. We're looking at the mean of a group of n scores. This right here gives us the standard deviation of the distribution we should actually compare that to. Otherwise, everything's exactly the same. Does that make sense? So the fundamental difference between a z-score and a z-test is with a z-score, you're using an individual score and you're using the standard deviation of the whole population. With a z-test, you're using the mean of a sample of scores and the standard error of the mean, which you have to use because that's the standard deviation of the, the distribution that it sort of belongs to. Does that make sense? Say that one more time. Um, you have to do the equation on the yes. First and then yes. So notice here, all you need to know is the population mean, which is in our z-test formula. You need to know your sample mean, which is in our z-test formula. You need to know the, the population standard deviation. And you just need to know what your sample size was. I pulled out 10 people, or I pulled out 5 people, or whatever. Does that make sense? It's the exact same thing. It's just you're comparing a group rather than a single individual. Cool. So this is important because from here, I'm going to start pulling pieces of information away. And this is the only difference between the t-test and the z-test. You guys ready? Everyone, you feel like you got the z-test stuff down? 